Simon, did you want to get us started? I can do that. Let us begin. Oh, kia ora koutou. Uh, welcome to this webinar on Indigenous community responses to COVID in urban and related homelands. We are hosted by Well Living House and the National Association of Friendship Centres and also the Near National Coordinating Centre. Uh, if you're picking up on the accent, uh, I'm not from Canada. Uh, I'm from Aotearoa, New Zealand. My tribal connections are to Tuhui and Ngāti Pani from a place called Waikere Moana, and I'm uh, the executive director of the National Coordinating Centre. There is a French interpretation available to all participants, which you can access using the Zoom control panels at the bottom of your screen. Bonjour, Robert. Thank you very much for helping out there. Uh, and please, all participants, be free uh, to engage with each other, respond to panelists, post links and resources into the webinars chat. I presume many of you are becoming quite familiar with uh, the technology. There's always a few little hiccups so we can just roll with that. Uh, if you want to ask any questions to the panelists, you can use the Q&A function and this ensures that your questions won't get buried somewhere in the chat. So there's no need to raise your hand, just ask away. Q&A portion of the webinar will take us to about quarter past eight Eastern time, about quarter past six here in Saskatchewan. And all participants are welcome to stay logged on as we run past uh, that eight o'clock or six o'clock in time. We recognize that this will extend it beyond its original schedule, but please, no pressure to say if you need to go. Uh, and I'd like to introduce now our two uh, speakers. First of all, uh, Laurie Bouvier. Uh, Manitoba Métis, formerly trained as a nurse, and she has made Saskatoon her home since 2005. She's passionate about Indigenous issues and policies. In her work as the Executive Director of the Aboriginal Friendship Centres of Saskatchewan, she's shown her strong commitment to ensuring that urban Indigenous people are represented when working with Indigenous peoples. Laurie chairs the Community Advisory Board of the Saskatoon Housing Initiative Programme and sits on the National Negotiating Committee for the Friendship Centre Movement, making sure that those urban Indigenous voices are heard and represented so that policies developed with Indigenous people also take in mind those living in urban areas. She and her husband have five daughters who have grounded her undoubtedly to focus on the meaning of true family connections. She spent many hours with her family in hockey rinks, dance theatres and snowmobile trails all over Saskatchewan. Dr. Janet Smiley is a member of the Métis Nation of Ontario with Métis roots here in Saskatchewan. She is a family physician and a public health researcher, currently works as a research scientist at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto in the Centre for Research on Inner City Health, where she directs the Well Living Health Applied Research Centre for Indigenous Infant, Child and Family Health. Her primary academic appointment is as professor in the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. She maintains a part-time clinical practice at Seventh Generation Midwives Toronto. Her research interests are focused in the area of addressing the health inequities that challenge Indigenous infants, children and their families through applied health services research. She holds the CIHR Applied Public Health Research Chair in Indigenous Health and Knowledge. Janet has six children, including twin boys and eight grandchildren. I do not believe that. You're it's way too some, young. Sorry. That's a mistake. The eight grandchildren is a typo. It's three. But uh, yeah, it's good. Oh. Yeah. Let's consider that eight an aspirational goal. Okay. Okay. Kids. <laughs> yeah. So, look, kia ora koutou and welcome, and I will hand it over now, and we've changed the original order, and uh, Laurie, you're going to go first. Mm. Well, thank you, Simon. Um, thank you for that kind introduction. We're patiently waiting for our grandchildren, so Janet, I, I hear you. So, um, thank you for the invite to this uh, very important conversation. To give a little bit of context, the Aboriginal Friendship Centers of Saskatchewan consist of 10 friendship centers that are members to our Provincial Territorial Association that provide services and programs for the communities um, that are oftentimes the hubs of the community uh, to make sure that we have an open space to provide programs and services from. Um, and in getting into the conversation today in March of 2020, Friendship centers have begun to mobilize around the emerging needs of the communities due to COVID-19. 
a global pandemic has um, heightened and increased polarized the urban indigenous service requirements. So what we have managed to do is to take the last 18 months of on the ground consultations with our friendship centers that have gathered information from the community level by way of uh, we've had um, feasibility studies done on infrastructure. We've had community plans adapted to ensure that community needs are being met. Uh, the gaps are being analyzed and identified while ensuring that we have um, making reference to our first ever Saskatchewan. Um, it's the Saskatchewan, in, Saskatchewan Indigenous Women's Economic Framework. What we're able to do there is to apply a women and gender based analysis and lens to the work that we do, identifying the top barriers that our women face, that are their members of the LGBTQ2S community face and really adapting any of the work that we're doing, tying into the calls for justice, the calls to action, and of course the UNDRIP as well. Utilizing all of those resources that we had currently had, we were able to adapt into um, a current need of COVID and how COVID has impacted um, everything for friendship centers regarding their finance, whether they needed PPE, their IT infrastructure, uh, the um, adaptations to programs and services, the impacts of not being able to self-fund some initiatives at the local friendship center levels. Uh, everyone knows that fundraising, you couldn't do bingos, you couldn't do drives. So the economic impact of that was also analyzed. What we were able to do um, is to have a three-part survey that we send out to our friendship centers just to make sure that we're keeping our finger on the pulse um, of what the communities are needing, facing, and to start building some of the, um, the sustainability pieces that will be needed post COVID. Everyone's very concerned with COVID as it is right now. What we're starting to look at are the impacts post COVID and what that looks like um, moving into the next phase. One interesting um, piece to the surveys that we found was when COVID first hit and the first um, surveys went out in May, everyone had a very strong um, personal safety um, concern. They were concerned to have PPE. They were concerned to have food security. They were concerned to have a safe space in, our, in which to get services and programs. What was really interesting is in the, the last one in October, um, that shifted. It shifted to more of a economic stability piece that included people being scared of losing their job, of losing their income, having no access to proper income to support themselves and their family. That was an interesting piece that I think is really crucial to how we position ourselves post COVID, because everyone knows that it's rather easy now to get the PPE. Um, toilet paper doesn't seem to be an issue anymore, but what is seems to be an issue is making sure that we still have our long-term jobs. So with that, um, when we were first approached by um, the federal government to um, get some urban indigenous COVID relief funding, we need to make sure that when we do do this, that we're using um, a different model that can still, that doesn't allow for a jurisdictional issue. So if you're using a distinction based approach, we need to be careful that those distinction based approaches to uh, service delivery, especially during a, a pandemic response is more following intersectional lens. So making sure that we have um, identification. So whether you're First Nations, Inuit, Métis, what your residents are, are you from the province, territory, municipality? Making sure that we know the gender and how gender identity and sexual orientation play a factor. We all know that safety um, has become a huge concern that we're trying to closely monitor, monitor so that we adapt our policies that we develop 
um, within the province, working with our, our stakeholders and our partners to make sure that they all stay relevant. So those are, those are some of the things that in Saskatchewan in particular um, that we're working on. We are always looking to have um, data collected. Um, that's something that I can offer to, um, I know Janet, we had spoken a little bit earlier on just the capabilities of what we have. And we have access to data that if properly used and or sought out, we can increase the amount of um, data collection that really encompasses the urban lens that needs to be applied when you're talking about urban indigenous people. So that is something that I will offer to um, all policy decision makers. And it's really strengthened the work that we're doing internally to make sure that our national association has the information that they need as well. A good, um, a good something to celebrate is the fact that we do have a network of awesome people that work in friendship centers, in the friendship center family within the movement and our friends. We haven't been able to get to where we are alone. We have a plethora of community partners, federal partners, provincial partners that have all helped us get through this so far. What we just need is a little extra push just to make sure that we're starting to think about the sustainability of the post COVID. So I think that's wraps up the work that we're doing in a couple of minutes. Oh, kia ora, Laurie. Thanks very much for that. You mentioned data, uh, and data is through all research. And now data is digital. Um, people talk of big data. And for Indigenous peoples, we're now starting to talk about data sovereignty. But what are some of the, the layers of, of sovereignty, security, uh, and safety that you see in your work when it comes to managing data? So internally, um, and we and I, I appreciate the sovereignty of it because we need to remain that the information that we collect is that of our own. We need to make sure that it, it does remain safe and that it does not go out into a space where it will be used inappropriately. So when we collect our data, we make sure that we have a space for it. And what we're collecting data on, um, is, is more, is, isn't just the programmatic side. So what we're actually looking for is for the impacts. So how many women are accessing? How many gender-based violence programs are we offering? How many uh, programs are we offering that could suffice other policy decisions? So I guess the data that we collect could be rounded on another space so that we could help round out an urban lens instead of it only being a distinction-based approach that has a jurisdictional um, issue that may not include that of the urban space. Mm. Yeah. And I notice uh, all uh, through the Indigenous world, we, we often talk urban and we dichotomize it as different from rural. I mean, what links okay. do you see here in Saskatchewan, but also, in, and Dr. Smiley will pick up on this, I'm sure, later on in, in her talk. It's not really a dichotomy, is it, no. between no. urban and non-urban? Non so how do we get across to, to governments uh, and non-Indigenous researchers that we kind of all know each other, we're all kind of related, and we're all looking at different ways to collaborate. So what are the different ways that we can start working for here in Saskatchewan, but across the country and start breaking down this, this assumption that, that others have about us? Um, I guess really quickly, just to analyze that the urban space has an entire ecosystem that lives within it. So really diving into that ecosystem and understanding that the urban lens being applied to specific areas of policy might not include that of the urban people. We're all the same people. Mm -hmm. But when the problem is when you collect your data, 
that is especially going to formulate policy if you don't include that of the urban and it's only those that are not or, or urban and distinction based approach being on reserve, uh, off reserve, Metis settlements, Inuit, you miss the urban lens. Mm -hmm. And when most people in Canada, 85% of us live in urban cities, mm -hmm. that's a potential huge gap that we're not being properly um, counted mm -hmm. and or applied. And you mentioned rising concerns about economic uh, loss and unemployment and, and exacerbation of poverty and so on. Yeah. There's an old saying from a, from a 1970s, 1970 earthquake in Chile, where the local people there started to talk about, well, first there was the earthquake, then there was the disaster. And what they were meaning was that the rebuild and the recovery was actually a very, very corrupt process that you either had connections to people who were going to help you recover or you didn't. And if you didn't, then you were worse off. So now we're going into six months, seven months, second wave, third wave. This could go on for some time. And you mentioned those economic concerns. Is this going to really put a lot of Indigenous communities in a worse place than they were 2019? And many communities were struggling in 2019. To be honest, I don't know if anyone has really dove into the post COVID yet. I think it's now starting. And I would hate to talk on behalf of those that are in that space, just because I'm not privy to it. All I know is that it was identified through our survey that caught me off guard. And being a nurse, I am very systems orientated. I know the end result that I need out of everything that I do, just because you have codes and you have to make sure that you're moving steps to steps. Uh, so applying that theory to my entire basis of being, I'm already post COVID and I need to make sure that I am setting up our urban indigenous um, environments through friendship centers the best way I can. And that's a scary place because I don't know what that is yet. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just also thinking uh, across the country now, and Indigenous people have actually always been quite mobile. Uh, mm -hmm. We look for jobs. I mean, I've moved hemispheres for, for work. Uh, do you see that sort of movement and migration perhaps increasing after COVID, as people start to think, well, if I'm going to be in a pandemic, I want to be in this place or in this jurisdiction or in this health area. Is that going to lead to, to increased migration or do you think people are going to more hunker down? I would only have personal feelings on that and I can't really draw on any of the research that we have done. The only thing that I can quickly identify is when we're starting to look at programs and services being offered from friendship centers, there has been a shift in what is being offered. So if I were looking at it through a lens of being scared for my, my uh, economic viability, um, moving and ensuring that we have spaces available to ensure that technology is is being um, properly administered. Um, technology is going to become and has become the way we do business. And that that is scary. A lot of centers were actually scared to go down that road and in fact hadn't thought of it. So how to think about providing for your families and how you're going to be accessing services. Um, I know that medical appointments were all done via um, video. Um, they were all being done through other sorts. Uh, sorry, I have, um, I just got a bug in my office. I don't want to be part of the memes that are <laughs> currently going around. So yes, I'm going to avoid that at all costs. Um, so yes, just applying the, techn the technology piece to it, I think is a shift that's going to be required. So I don't have an answer for you because I don't know that answer. Yeah. No, no, fair enough. And you mentioned the technology. Uh, we were chatting earlier today 
the technology divide that it's an assumption that all students, for instance, at universities can access online lectures with the latest iPhone and have yeah. great Wi-Fi and all that. Do you see any generational differences with the technology? Uh, uh, you know, are elders comfortable communicating in, in Zoom and all that and, and uh, you know, their grandchildren? What's going on in communities with the technology? That has been a challenge. Um, a lot of our friendship centers have um, not accepted the fact that we do have to go virtual, they lose the connectivity. And I think if you go back and acknowledge the indigenous culture aspect of it, we are a people person. We are very uh, family orientated. Visiting someone through a Zoom just doesn't have the same effects. It was kind of cool at the beginning because I thought I will never have to leave my office for another meeting again. Um, in the eight, months that now we're into it, I fully acknowledge that I'm over it. I don't want to do it anymore. I need that human interaction. So I think what's happening in the centers is the fact that they need that human interaction. And when you're talking about the vulnerable community and the vulnerable sector, they don't have access to proper technology in order to get the services that they need. So in the beginning, all of the friendship centers have had to decrease their programmatic uh, needs. The only ones that didn't close are those that had homelessness uh, programming. Those never shut. So the impact of that was actually huge because um, when everyone else was closing down, the friendship centers were the only ones left open in their communities in some instances. So the influx of that actually increased. With the technical aspects of it are the increase of bandwidth. Most of our communities in the North, for an example, don't have access to proper bandwidth to offer their programs and services. So we've made sure that when we're evaluating the costs associated with COVID and any funding um, allocation matrix that we're developing, we're ensuring that technology is actually a really big factor when we're talking about how we're actually supporting our friendship centers. Yeah. Um, we did have, we have some key relationships with um, large organizations that have offered us um, tablets at a lower cost. Our National Association of Friendship Centers has actually offered to offset some of the costs. We have offset some of the costs just to make sure that the economic impact of that doesn't go to the friendship center themselves. So we're starting. Um, we're just getting some resistance with the need or the requirement to go virtual. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. That's really interesting. And uh, a confession, I now miss airports and airport food <laughs> and overpriced airport food. Uh, thanks very much for that, Laurie. And I'm sure uh, Dr. Smiley will pick up on some of those points and add some more. So kia ora, Janet, over to you. Nancy, everyone. Um, it's really good to uh, um, be on the webinar tonight. Um, and uh, thank you, Lori. Um, I always love following um, a community leader um, speaking about their good work. Um, I don't know about other people. We talked a little bit about Zoom fatigue. Um, so um, yeah, I've had a few Zoom meetings. So I will try to um, encourage everyone to just move around a little bit. Um, in case um, I might lose you. I think that there's three kind of themes that I want to draw out. So sometimes when I um, do a talk, I just say, okay, what are some of the take home messages? Um, and just trying to build on what I heard from Lori and the discussion with Simon. Um, first of all, um, First Nations Inuit people live in um, urban and related homelands. Right, and we say urban and related homelands, of course, because, yeah, I don't change um, from being like uh, Janet Smiley with like a long um, kin tie, long maternal kin tie running across the prairies, like um, when I travel from Saskatchewan to Toronto, right? Um, so um, we are alive and well. Right, and, and I think I heard Lori say like 85%. So definitely the 
majority of First Nations and Métis people live in cities and an increasing number of Inuit people live in cities. Um, so this is actually just a reality um, that actually kind of gets masked almost on a daily basis. And um, I think COVID actually has presented an opportunity to maybe challenge that reality. Um, so we're alive and well, we've been here for some of us for quite a long time. Um, we were talking earlier, Lori, about how um, Métis people um, helped build some prairie cities. So my grandma came into Saskatoon in the dirty thirties, right? Um, so, um, and uh, yeah, there's probably some uh, other people on the line um, who may have had relatives um, coming into um, prairie cities. So there's some really great urban prairie city history about Métis people. Um, and also First Nations relatives um, coming into the cities a little later. Of course, the Indian Act controlled some of that, the Indian agent. Um, but uh, yeah, um, the uh, post-COVID theme, um, and then um, just the fact, another myth, I think, that maybe we get more here in Ontario um, because people see um, like absurd wealth in a city like Toronto, um, but there's also um, absurd social challenge, right? So we hear about like, there's an assumption then, oh, people made it because they moved to the city. Um, but when we actually gather our own information, we find out there's a lot of struggles. So just trying to highlight that. So a little bundle of stuff around just this theme that we are here and we've been here and we'll continue to be here after COVID, um, um, but to challenge that dichotomy as well. The next one was really around, um, like we have been impacted by COVID. First Nations, Inuit and Métis living in urban and related areas have been impacted by COVID. Um, and, you know, I know um, because uh, I worked um, like uh, at um, some of the centers that were treating people for COVID. Um, so across the country and here in Toronto, um, early on we recognized that people who didn't have shelter um, would need a place to self-isolate while they're waiting for test results or um, like uh, trying to isolate. Um, so I was um, in my clinical role working at um, the shelters that were set up in Toronto um, in April and uh, May and June. Um, and uh, we also know that there's a disproportionate number of Indigenous people in the community of people who are sheltered. Um, so. Um, as we watched the official numbers, right, coming from uh, the federal government about the rates of COVID during wave one, I knew right here in Toronto, we had more people that had COVID, were hospitalized with COVID, or had died from COVID directly or indirectly during the time of COVID than like we were hearing on the national reports, um, because those reports were um, not based on the reality of actually where First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people are living, right? Either by choice or um, by um, imposed circumstance um, in the country. And then we have an absurd um, federal data system that actually then chops us up into these different compartments, um, which um, to me is quite different um, than the actual distinct nationhood um, that we would have as um, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people um, and then, of course, um, across the diversity that fits into each of those very broad general groups. So um, when I challenge the way that um, certain uh, silos have been imposed on us by things like the Indian Act, I'm never challenging um, self-identified um, like uh, distinct nationhood in, in kin ties. Um, but it's just absurd to me that we have a data system and a public health surveillance system that follows these very old fashioned, like externally imposed ideas of who we are. Um, so it's always fun to be on Zoom late at night and uh, mix things up a little bit. The final theme that I heard and that I think is um, probably um, the most important, like is we're, we're strong and networked in cities, right? And like we're, we're adaptable. So. This second wave, because I think here in Toronto, we're definitely in a second wave. If you look at the waves, I think I did um, another webinar just showing like the waves are really just these waves, um, like uh, in their little graphs that uh, data people make up around um, how many cases of COVID there are. So our hospitals are getting full and stuff. That's gonna be tough, right? Like it's tough mentally, right? And you know, maybe some people, not all of us had a little bit like of, um, 
stored up dry meat in the pantry, but that might be gone now, right? So we, it's going to hurt more economically um, and we're tired and it's winter time. So we're um, going to have to be strong, but we're networked. I heard that word networked. It's our, we have maintained in cities, right? Um, what in my um, understanding is at the root of um, almost any First Nations and Order Métis community, I've had the opportunity um, to um, be present in, um, which is our relationships with each other, with land um, and with all things. Um, so those things are alive and well in the city. And then we build things based on that, right? And those are the grassroots models that work. And that's why I love that I got to follow Lori today because of course she talked about grassroots models that work, right? So a whole bunch of people are all worried in May. There was a big discussion somehow. I think I was even named. I was gonna be solving all these complicated data problems. <laughs> Lori was already solving them. The Friendship Center already solved them, right? Like that's good, see, I gotta laugh, right? Because. <laughs> She has the data. She just did what is common sense. She reached out using the social networks that are based on trust relationships that are based on like decades of service and um, like reciprocal um, supports that the Friendship Center movement has built up. And then she just said, well, how are you doing? Right. And a long time ago, maybe we would have gotten together like in larger community gatherings and maybe some of the women would have sat together after doing some visiting and then it would be like, how was it? Because you might not have seen like, um, you know, your relative Lori who lived like in a bit of a distant community, like you saw each other maybe once or twice a year and how was it? And I know you had a hard time, you know, um, or so-and-so was having a hard time. So what happened, right? And that was our way of checking in. So now we use some paper, right? Like in, um, maybe some electronic surveys, but that would, that's what happened that I understood. And she's done it three times. And then actually um, that's such a valuable system. And to me, it resonates with what I understand some of maybe our historic ways of checking in, like in Métis Creek communities were. Um, and now she can use that to better meet the needs and she's listening and there's some surprises in there, right? Like it's like, well, the biggest hardship now is economic. I'm not as scared about getting COVID anymore. Right. Um, I'm really worried like about what's going to happen after COVID. Um, so I guess um, I could riff a little bit on on data after those kind of three take home messages. Right. Like uh, and it's good, I guess. Um, yeah, don't go to sleep for the data part, though. No, um, but, uh, so, <laughs> I'm a data um, geek, too. So we're good. 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 We're that's in this good. together. It's good to be data geeks in today's world, right? And anybody that wants to, I was all into trying to set up, I want to um, work with others so we can train a whole bunch more First Nations Inuit and ET data geeks. And um, I had to put some of that on hold until May. I'm saying things are on hold till May 2021 while we uh, wrestle with this COVID thing. But yeah. see, that's what we need another cadre of very smart First Nations Inuit and ET data people. And then you can make the data systems that reflect your realities because maybe you don't agree with everything that I said about how I see it but I haven't met very many First Nations and Métis data geeks that actually agree with how the Indian Act sees it right or how we're getting divided into these um kind of little silos and yeah, yeah or that we don't travel or go back and forth um so yeah what I did early on um during COVID, in addition to calling, I think Jocelyn Formsma, so thank you, um, uh, National Association for Indian Friendship Centers for partnering up and also to the um, uh, NEAR network for these opportunities, try to share information and, and work on some infographics that hopefully are reaching um, all of our um, relatives um, in urban and related homelands. Um, then of course, and I mentioned it already, I was like, oh no, I've already been worried like about this absence in the data systems because anybody that knows me I just I fail to accept the fact that we just leave out like usually Métis people just get left out right so I don't understand any population health data system anywhere else in Canada or the world where we just leave out major like subgroups of a major population just because we have like a 200 year old piece of legislation not quite 200 years old now in fact I think 1868 but um yeah, we're getting there. Hopefully it'll be gone by the time it's 200 years old, um, but there has to be then um, something that replaces it and honors the treaties. Um, so yeah, that's 
nuts to me or to just pretend. I was on a national call the other day and people kept talking about communities, right? And I'm like, if you're talking about First Nations communities on reserve, those are awesome communities, I support them, but like, let's, let's be clear on who we're speaking about. And in the cities, what's beautiful is we've maintained these networks but often in our youth really, um, I think uh, are probably better at it than me, um, but we've studied in Ontario the way that uh, First Nations, Inuit and Métis interact. And for sure there's nation specific networks and you know it really depends where you are in the country, um, but there's um, depending on where you are in a city like Toronto, for example, we saw a lot of cross linkage between First Nations and Métis. Um, so um, in the social network. So that was interesting to me as well. So yeah, how do we solve this problem then? Like where we have federal provincial jurisdiction um, and then a lot of times there's an assumption in the data world um, that you don't need to count First Nations, Inuit and Métis when they live in cities. And actually we haven't really even invested in the infrastructure. And early on in COVID, like I heard they were having like 600 doctors right? Like uh, that we're going to be working for First Nations on reserve. And I was getting a bit nervous. I'm like, whoa, we have like 70,000 Indigenous people here in Toronto, like, uh, and I'm one doctor. And then luckily there are a couple other Indigenous doctors and a lot of good allied doctors. But yeah, there wasn't a team of 600 people. I don't have a team of 600 people helping out with, with our new COVID testing center. And that's the other hard part, because never, ever, ever would I want to undermine like jurisdiction and authority. Yeah. for First Nations on reserve or Inuit in the North. So, but as soon as we start having the conversation, it almost sounds like, I guess it could be. So if anyone's interpreted that as um, me kind of undermining like the critical um, gaps in terms of health services and basic infrastructure on reserve or Inuit in the North, that wasn't my intention. I just want us to um, like uh, all be counted in, in a good way and like to honor our strengths wherever we are um, and then to figure out how we can work together to address those challenges. So we got some broken data systems. So we've been trying to work on that a little bit. So um, other um, parts of the country have been very strong, some of the First Nations regions, because the other problem was um, a lot of the data was being collected by the province and the territories and public health agency of Canada. Um, so working, um, so I've witnessed First Nations regions and the First Nations Health Information Governance Centre do amazing things in terms of actually repatriating their own data, getting their own data back from PHAC and the provinces and the territories. And then the other thing some of us have been trying to do so that we can get information about First Nations, Métis and Inuit um, living in urban areas is to do linkages with the provincial and territorial data sets. So there's a lot of work to be done there. I guess here in Toronto, so just to maybe finish up my little piece, I hope I'm not, I'm probably talking a bit fast for the translator. I just wanted to talk about um, and to talk um, a little bit about some of the specific things that happened, because I think we heard Lori talk about all these same things kind of happening across the whole province um, and about like uh, using local models based out of like uh, friendship centers. So by community for community. Um, so in the first wave, as I think we heard from Lori too, and others may relate to the first thing that happened is when we had the shutdown people's lifelines were cut off. Yeah. Um, but like you, Lori, a lot of our Indigenous services stayed open and we saw these amazing things happen, right? So right away, so um, Toronto Aboriginal Support Services Council, you got to give a shout out for Lindsay Kretschmer. She had a cell phone and she was just answering it from the community and like then getting people to take like formula, right? Because it would be babies without diapers and formula, um, hungry elders. Right, people got together and they had to figure out quickly how can you do that in a socially distanced way, pack food boxes, but food boxes were getting dropped off for elders. Um, so it was just intense. People were working really long days. Um, then, and part of the silver lining in, is that really people pulled together. And it was kind of cool because a lot of times I'm like busy running around doing mad scientist research stuff. So all of a sudden I'm doing clinical work, right? And I'm on the community calls. Um, so that felt really good too. And I got to connect. I've been in Toronto for a little while, but I got to connect with a lot of different community people that sometimes I hadn't gotten to see. Um, another really big milestone here for us in Toronto is Anishinaabe Health Toronto got funded and they set up a mobile um, uh, healing unit 
like that's in in our, our recreational vehicle. Um, because a big thing, and this might be um, similar for people like in other urban and related areas, like access to testing was a problem. And big cities like Toronto, like our hospitals aren't safe. And they actually got worse during COVID, mm -hmm. right? So like, and of course, um, you know, we're all aware of the um, tragic um, death of uh, Joyce Echequan um, in the Joliet Hospital. Um, so amazing that she actually managed to film, right? Um, but I think many of us um, also know that um, these things happen like uh, not only to Joyce, it's just that others aren't able to film it. Um, so people are afraid in hospitals in my experience. Um, I'm happy if that's not the case where you live, but most of my relatives like uh, who, particularly those who maybe um, uh, have less white skin privilege or white passing privilege perhaps than I do, like they'll call um, and ask or we'll go and try to support them to make sure that um, they're treated not only with kindness and respect, but that they actually get the care um, that is the standard of care. Um, so anyways, having that Anishinaabe health ban out, because another thing that happened in big cities like Toronto, I think it happened um, in other urban centers too. There was some of our people that are living rough, like so that they're without shelter. They were so clever, like they started camping far away from each other and in places that were um, harder to find. Um, so anyways, that mobile healing unit's really amazing. And then they opened up access to people for tests as well. Um, another thing that was really amazing to watch um, was um, we have a, a group of Indigenous midwives here in Toronto called um, Seventh Generation Midwives Toronto. So they opened up a call anti hotline. So this phone line was more set around trying to answer any kinds of questions people had around COVID or emerging health issues. Um, so because as I mentioned before, what happened is like usually I don't do a lot of clinical work, um, but um, I tend to end up um, it, at the Seven Generation Midwives Clinic every other Wednesday. So some people know that they can drop by and find me there, right? And a lot of other people um, in our community, like uh, they know, okay, today's Monday, you know, I can go see Cheryl Lee um, at the drop-in. Um, but that wasn't happening anymore because we were doing most of our care virtually. So having this call anti-helpline was really good. Um, and then um, we've been trying to get out a lot more outreach workers. So the last thing, like of just some little examples of things that we've been working on um, is um, we've been working very hard over the last couple of weeks. So I've been working um, with uh, Native Men's Residents, the director, Steve Teakins, mm -hmm. since April or May, he's been saying, hey, wait a minute, I've got this um, extra building used to be rented as a health clinic. Why don't we actually set up a fixed testing site, right? And that could be really good too, because 70,000 people is a lot of people. Um, we know um, that 85% of the First Nations Inuit and Métis living in Toronto are living below the poverty line. So we have a lot of crowded housing and multi-generational families. Amazing resilience, right? Like people with COVID, like one person living in a house, multi-generational house, three generations. The middle generation gets COVID, but manages to protect the elder and the kids in a one bedroom apartment, right? Like, uh, so yeah, we could write the public health books really. Steve Teakins that I was just mentioning, um, they had the first shelter outbreak in Toronto. And again, interestingly enough, how we get masked. Or... Right, because Toronto Public Health had a list of them, um, but they, um, like uh, Steve just hired a cleaner, um, got all the food delivered. I think I'm freezing up a bit, but maybe I'm back. Yeah, you're back. Okay, great. So I was just talking about um, Steve and how he stopped the outbreak in NAMI Res, and then he wanted a testing center because two, every time he tried to send one of his guys to the hospital for the testing center, because most of our testing centers in Toronto are affiliated with hospitals, um, it's very difficult. Um, so anyways, we're hoping on Monday to open up a, a new, um, like a Indigenous, um, specific testing center mm -hmm. um, in the city of Toronto. And then we've got linked outreach and then we're gonna do our own primary data collection as well. So we'll have like, uh, we've had these our health counts projects for a little while where we do urban indigenous data collections. So it'll be called We Count COVID. Um, so we're, we're pretty excited about that. Congratulations. 
yeah, so that's uh, kind of what we've been up to. And I'm happy to hear Lori and Simon, any thoughts or questions that you have, and then hopefully we can hear from our audience as well. Go to Janet, that's awesome. Compliments Laurie's uh, stuff perfectly. Uh, there are some questions piling up in the chat box and there's a couple in the Q&A box as well. Something I wanted to ask Janet before we switch over to those, a lot of parents on the line and there'll be some grandparents as well and we're all trying to reassure the children and you know they're getting messages all the time. Um, and, and anxiety is kind of like the 21st century. Uh, what sort of advice as a, as a clinician, uh, someone working in with community, a researcher, what sort of advice could you or would you give to parents and grandparents and, and guardians who uh, just want to reassure their children? Yeah, so four seasons of COVID, right? So when we're, we're seasonal people, right? So spring was tough, right? We got a little relief in summer. Now we're in the fall. Fall... Like, uh, yeah, we're um, having some fall colors, right? If COVID is just a tricky relative, a tricky relative that can be pretty mean, right? Um, yeah, she's showing her fall colors, right? She likes to come out in big gatherings. Um, and then winter, winter. So the thing is, though, as an Indigenous people in Canada, we know we have to prepare for wall, fall and winter anyways, right? So winter um, may also be a bit tough but then we're gonna come out the other side. It's gonna be a little better once we get to spring, right? It's still, then we're gonna to have to live with COVID for another four seasons, but the next four seasons will be better prepared, right? And then after that, I guess we can, yeah, hopefully um, start dealing with um, our abusive mother earth or something like that. <laughs> um, so that piece, so just like putting actually a timeline in a pattern like some people have found the metaphor of this tricky relative, right? That can be a hurtful relative. Reminding people that we already know everything we need to know, right? Like, so we have all the teachings we need already to deal with this new tricky relative of COVID. And we're actually really good at lots of the basic stuff. Some of it's really hard, okay? But we've lived through a lot of things as First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. Um, so all we have to do with this one, the things they're just like anything else, anything nasty, we can control it with protocol, right? And there's three things that we can do, right? So social distance is hard. It, the hardest part for me is when I'm at the end of the family gathering or the end of the visit with my auntie and I can't hug them, right? Um, but we've had to do other hard things, really other hard things, right? And we get to see that auntie, right? Or that relative again, right? Um, so, so there's that, the social distance, right? And then there's the mask. See, and there's this whole already, like I was like, there's a whole industry of mask and see, we can still have fun. So I have my Halloween mask on, that's baby Yoda. Um, so, and then I pull it off like this, right? So we can have fun with these things, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, and then there's washing our hands. Um, yeah. I guess the other piece is just to keep our social circles as small as possible. And we talked about that at the last webinar. So I try to do a little checklist. So on the Thanksgiving weekend, I did pretty well. I kind of mucked up the first night um, because I have a friend with kids. And of course, um, there was like a visit, right? Like, and then it's really hard. And those of you with young kids know that, right? Young kids can't remember. Oh, well, I can't go sit in Auntie Janet's lap, right? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, put my hand in the fruit bowl like take a bite and then put the fruit back. Um, so, but then, um, so we need to try to keep our circles as small as possible. So we've gone through hardship. We know how to make sacrifice for collective benefit in our communities. I think that's probably why we did better in the first wave than people mm. thought we would. Mm. So I guess it's time limited. It has a rhythm, right? It's a relative, right? And we know everything that we need. Um, I think it's going to be harder in winter and like um, Lori said, the economic hardship continues. So part of that is to continue to kind of advocate. One of the things like I'm hoping that we can do and others are doing is we can now be having public health sovereignty, right? Like, so we're um, able hopefully in this We Count COVID project um, to exert some public health um, sovereignty. Um, so yeah, I think um, remembering like uh, to try to support each other and help each other in a mental health way, like in a material way, this is um, going to be a time where 
some of us actually have more work, right? Um, we need to remember those um, who are gonna be struggling a little bit, but that's again, where our whole relational social network ways of life are gonna help us. And hopefully um, our allied partners um, are not gonna renege on their commitments to reconciliation. Yeah, good point. Oh, kia ora, that was excellent. Uh, there's a data question has popped up there, uh, more for Laurie, a uh, question from Andrea. Will Saskatchewan Friendship Centre survey data and the findings be disseminated publicly or is it primarily for internal purposes? That is an awesome question and we've actually talked about that internally. Um, it's going to be made public once we can fully analyze the data. So what that means is we have um, a fantastic researcher that we're working with uh, out of Winnipeg. He's actually with the University of Manitoba. So a shout out to Chris Campbell if he's on here. Uh, fantastic to work with, very community orientated and has really prepared the information that we're gathering in a way that makes sense and is easily able to be analyzed. So what we're going to be doing is after the third round, so after the full survey, we will be analyzing that data to make sure that it's being put out to the public. The data that we collect is not our own. We're just collecting it for the sake of others to make sure that what we're doing is the right thing. So the data doesn't belong to us. Um, and in fact, we would be doing our community a disservice if we didn't share it. So absolutely. Um, and in fact, if anyone has any questions with any, any data that we have that could help them formulate any uh, response, um, policy development, relationship building, we are more than happy to help support that because it will only help support the urban indigenous lens that it needs to be applied uh, as we work forward. So absolutely. That was a really long answer and I apologize, but I'm just really passionate about the data. No, look, that's that's really important. Um, and data, I mean, data are people. Excel yeah. spreadsheets contain people. Uh, and we know as Indigenous researchers that that comes with an ethical obligation that a lot of researchers have for a long time been able to ignore because it's not obvious to them that it's that is people. So I think, and it came up uh, earlier, the training of, of researchers uh, and valuing data geeks. Uh, I've said this in some other presentations, our elders and our knowledge keepers, knowledge holders, um, komata, what we would call komata in New Zealand, they were always curious. They would never exclude any, any new way of looking or interpreting things, new research. They would examine it, interrogate it see where it would fit in and if, if they could work alongside with it. And that, that remains now. And in fact, that actually can introduce um, an interesting question here from Dr. Caroline Tate. Dr. Tate asks, if the data collected are blood, tissue or saliva samples, for example, and she's talking here specifically of the seroprevalence uh, study on COVID, how do friendship centers and their community members see this type of research? Are people willing to provide blood samples and have this data stored and analyzed outside of the community? How does the community then protect itself from exploitation? Mm. Is that a question for me? Or is that more of a statement? Because I don't really know that there's more of a question. Um, and I know where she's going with that because formally trained in the medical field, the whole access to information piece is crucial. So when we're talking about medical files and having access to personal information, that's a very intricate, sensitive uh, data, data collection, like an entire set of data that you need to be sure that falls in line with an, a proper um, information to privacy. So I guess yeah. Am I prepared to have friendship centers collect blood and spit samples? No, that, that would fall outside of the scope of work that we do and offer. Uh, but it'd be kind of neat to share the information that is collected through that way with our friendship centers. Mm. 
I was mm. going to maybe just jump in if I might. Like one thing, Simon, when you were talking about your elders, like um, when we started just collecting information, because I believe when people like uh, share information in a survey, um, like that's actually um, an extension like of their sacred being, right? Because it's observations about how we are in the world. Mm. Um, and actually, um, I think... Um, like I think about our midwives actually as the longitudinal um, data set holders. Like if we thought about a longitudinal study, um, one um, way of thinking about how that would have operated in our own communities um, was like actually our midwives um, because they would have been following people through the life course, at least as I understand their roles, like uh, from my own Métis Creek perspective. Um, so, um, like uh, actually when we started one of these um, surveys in Toronto, like uh, we had a discussion with some elders and knowledge keepers and community people over a couple of days. Um, and uh, that's where they said, okay, well, we'll trust the midwives as the custodians of that information. And in fact, with the collection of just information, right? Like again, that we're doing with We Count COVID in Toronto, the midwives are one of those partners, um, but now we're balanced out as well by having the native men's residents. I'm helping with that as well. So yeah, I'm quite concerned about like how quickly things are moving. And of course, things have to move quickly during COVID. And I can move very quickly. Um, like, uh, and sometimes that's not the best way. I've sometimes had to learn the hard way um, that quick isn't always better. I guess I heard, um, I think it might have been Carmen Jones, um, the health director at Chiefs of Ontario, like talk about two things that you need for like First Nations state of sovereignty. And then I've been just thinking about it more generally and how I understood it or um, is uh, trust relationships and then content expertise. Those are two things. So I don't, I, I'm, um, that I thought about her after I heard her speak. So, I mean, if at least for some First Nations, Inuit or Métis people, like, and I guess I could only, um, in my understanding from my um, kind of Métis Cree worldview, like that is, sacred like biologic materials right like so it's like the essence like of our sacredness um so yeah that would be something you'd have to pretty much trust that's why you know some of us don't leave our hairline around because you know somebody else could pick that up and maybe if they don't trust you like some of us think we could that that's giving away a lot of power so mm -hmm. I think if you're going to be giving away power like that, then you need to have trust relationships. And then I think you would need to have, when I talk about the content expertise, it means like, what does it mean to live in the local place? Right. So, you know, um, I've been away from Saskatchewan. My grandma lived her life out there. My mom was born there. Right. But yeah, there's other people who know a lot more about what it might live be to live in that local place right now. So I wouldn't be the person to say that. Um, so those are just the things um, that I think are required if we're going to be doing that. And there could be some local places where like they're really excited, right? And curious and want to know. The other thing though, I do think is like the whole like genetic benefit of genetic science, I think gets overrated quite a bit, right? Like I don't think it's absent. I think it can be quite helpful, but also some of those genetic questions, a lot of them can be, um, like solved in non-Indigenous people. So the amount of things that we would actually benefit like from by having studies done specifically on our own like sacred genetic and biologic materials, not sure about that yet, but happy to have more discussions. Mm. I know when uh, geneticists describe DNA as the code of life, they can hardly be surprised when we get a little bit protective and yeah. uh, nervous around yeah. people playing with it and I don't know how many people have seen the movie Blood Quantum yet um, it's a zombie movie and an indigenous contribution to a fine genre of cinema very gross I don't recommend it for squeamish people but uh, very clever some very funny parts to it uh, and stating um, the obvious which I, and I don't want to give the, too much of the plot away but indigenous people are immune to the zombie virus and all the white people turn into <laughs> crazed, guts-eating, baby-eating zombies. The white people are the enemy. and Really clever twist on it. Um, there's a practical question here. Do people have to have status to get tested at the site in Toronto? 
I have this is no. from Sam. I have no. non-indigenous and non state indigenous in they go. No. Yeah, just self-identified First Nations, Inuit or Metis people. Um, and uh, yeah, we're asking people to make an appointment or have a referral, um, but we'll have someone at the door there. And we won't turn anybody away. There's long, long lines here in Toronto. They just made it appointment only. Um, but uh, yeah, we want to make sure it'll be, um, we have a, a modest capacity. Um, so yeah, we're trying to create a preferred pathway for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people in the city of Toronto. But yeah. we go with self-identification. Okay, okay, good to know. Yeah, it's uh, Indigenous people at the door. So I guess, yeah, that maybe raises the bar a little bit because uh, yeah, you got to self-identify within the community. Okay, that's cool. A uh, question from Fleur for Laurie. Can you tell us if you have collected data on Indigenous identity? First Nations, Métis, or Inuit. Uh, and we've found, and, and Fleur will be talking for uh, the NEAR network here, we have found that there are challenges when Indigenous people are grouped into a pan-Indigenous category. So the, the short answer to that is sort of. Um, and I say that with kind of a, you know, cheek, uh, you know, comment, but when we're trying to identify and to make sure that a distinction based approach does not need apply, I, although we need to collect that information to ensure that we have that data to make our case, right? So it's not necessarily that we need to know how many First Nation, how many Inuit and how many Métis people that we're serving it's more on how we're actually providing the service. So identifying who our target areas are and who is accessing our services the most and how we can actually diversify what that actually looks like through a provincial territorial association when we're talking to our governments, our municipalities, our federal ministers. Um, so yes, we do, although we do it very carefully because um, it has a really key piece to identity that we are very aware could be quite sensitive. Um, so we do collect it. It's not mandatory that friendship centers report on, although it would greatly help the way we formulate and position ourselves with the distinction-based approach. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Good, thank you. A uh, question here from, uh, oh, an anonymous attendee. Well, a comment more regards to the discussion on an increased use of technology. I'm thinking about my cookum and how she doesn't have internet in the elders lodge and just wondering how we can advocate accessing internet and even a cell phone. You did mention earlier, Laurie, that you have actually advocated for increased technology. Yes, um, absolutely. And I feel for all of the elders that don't have access and or uh, knowledge on how to work technology. If anyone has sat beside their grandmother, grandfather to try to get them to run a cell phone, you know the struggles are real. So um, some of the friendship centers are offering virtual spaces for their elders. Um, some of them are offering like a crash course on how to even operate a tablet. Mm -hmm. As far as like the bandwidth and do don't have access to proper internet or Wi-Fi, a lot of the friendship centers have moved to being offering free Wi-Fi, just so that if you are in, you can go to the parking lot. So if you're wanting to have a quick Zoom chat or Facebook live chat with your grandkids, most friendship centers do offer free Wi-Fi. Um, I would reach out to your local friendship center because I couldn't comment right off the top of my head who actually offers that, but it has been raised in quite a few concerns. With the segregation and isolation of our elders, we are very aware that mental health capacity could become um, a reality. They're usually the most resilient. Um, they're usually the most proud and will look after everyone else instead of themselves. So we have acknowledged that um, and we're trying to always find ways on how to connect with our elders. 
we have a really good, cool um, structure by way of a national Senate committee. So we have national senators, we have provincial organize, like our provincial PTAs all have um, a senator sitting at our table. And that's where we would lean on to make sure that we include the, the voices of our elders and what that means to the formulation of our programs. Mm -hmm. So I feel for them. I, um, yeah, and we're very aware of what that can do to mental health capacity. Yeah. I think there's some um, an opportunity, like just to try to address some of the um, disparities in access to bandwidth and infrastructure, especially if we need to keep the economy going, right? So, like, because it's also um, the school age kids. So here yeah. in Toronto, like in, in other places, like in Ontario and Quebec, um, mm -hmm. where the schools get shut down, right? Like, and so it's only like a, there's like a double standard right? Like a, a, a class length double standard. Um, and our realities as First Nations and Métis people is more often than not, it's a real hardship or impossible to have mm. bandwidth in a new computer yeah. and a new tablet. Um, so um, like uh, I know Six Nations, for example, like during the shutdown, like um, there wasn't adequate bandwidth, like in a lot of um, places. And then here in the city of Toronto, like uh, right now, even like some kids are going to school in person and some are able to do online learning, but that's not a choice for every kid. So I think just trying to like uh, advocate um, together, like around the real needs for bandwidth. Um, I have a nice story. My partner actually spent a bit of time with an elder um, the other week and taught them how to do a Zoom meeting, right? So that can actually be, it could be a new opportunity for elder youth link yeah. up right I guess we'd have to maybe um, figure out how to wipe down the device as it gets passed back and forth right um, but uh, yeah there's a, a reciprocal knowledge exchange um, because uh, yeah I know um, yeah I'm not very smart anymore like uh, at technology I used to think I was um, on. like on the cutting edge but I'm certainly not so um, and then also here in Toronto, we did see early on in first wave, um, there was um, philanthropists um, that were like giving out cell phones. So that was really important as well for our people who are out and about um, and cut off. Um, so again, during the second wave, people are tired, but let's see what we can do, right? To try to get technology into people's hands, to th think about programs where we can build on the strengths of some of our tech savvy youth um, yep. and maybe, um, that's and maybe they might be a bit shy to like uh, spend time with some elders, but yeah, maybe there's a, a summer like yeah, some some uh, part time work in there, um, hooking some elders up. Yeah, I remember driving an elder back from a meeting in New Zealand, and as we came over the hill, and we'd been out of cell reception range for two days, came over the hill, and it was boop, boop, yeah. boop, 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 on his phone, not my phone, his phone, and I said who's that? and he goes oh it's my mokos my grandchildren and he was this was an old-fashioned phone it was just text it was very simple for him to do it and in my head I just went aha he's connecting with his grandchildren they've missed him he's missed them it's a, and it was an, a traditional engagement through a a, a new technology it, it hadn't it hadn't uh, ruffled him at all he handled it with aplomb as so many of them do Question here, data question, uh, with COVID-19 social distance measures, locations of friendship centres throughout Saskatchewan, what method did you use to collect the information? Data is all through this. So we used uh, surveys uh, for the COVID specific impacts, just because all of the information that we had gathered before had all been done in person. Uh, we did community outreach to make sure that we gather information that was relevant to the communities and we wanted to be in the community in which we're asking these questions. Unfortunately, due to COVID, we weren't allowed to travel. Um, we've had to impact, you know, a bunch of policies that don't allow for travel at this time. So all of it has been done uh, by way of surveys. And quite frankly, we make sure that we call our friendship centers at least once a week, just to touch base. It's, it's a lonely world. Um, when you are a service provider, 
we have tried to take the ownership as a provincial territorial association in Saskatchewan in particular, that we want to take the load off of you. We don't want the friendship centers to have to do all of the surveying and having to go to our funders and the policy makers. We see that as our job. We're not the ones on the ground. Our job is to help support and bring up the work that's being done at the grassroots level. That's our role. So um, I forgot the question. I apologize. It was just a data collection right. question. And you've I love that so many people are interested in well, data. Where all are you guys to after? The end of our time. Any final comments? I, I'll just say thanks very much, everyone. I don't know if I'm frozen or not, but thanks um, for your time um, and stay safe and stay well. Um, and uh, yeah, don't forget um, that uh, this too will pass. I echo that. I do thank you for taking this opportunity to talk to us. Um, I always love talking about the work that we're doing here. So if we need to have further conversations, I would be more than glad to, um, to help facilitate those. Yeah, and it's really been nice. I just want to say thanks to Lori and, and Simon, um, and then uh, give a shout out to Robert, who's been interpreting. Um, and then to um, the team at Well Living House, Sam and Erica, and then also Fleur and her team um, at the um, Near Coordinating Centre um, for setting this all up and, and making it so easy for us. Kia ora koura, tēnā koura, tēnā koutou. Uh, be safe, look after yourselves, look after uh, your networks. Uh, the old ways still work, we all know that, and it's been a great session. Thank you all very much for attending. Thanks once again, Dr. Janet Smiley and Laurie Bouvier. Good night, all. Bye. Bye.